Canadian and American citizens are being warned to get out of parts of the Middle East amid fears that the war between Israel and Hamas could explode across the region. I'm Mercedes Stevenson. The West Block begins now. The first trucks carrying humanitarian aid crossed through the Rafa Gate on Saturday. But with angry protests spreading across the Middle East, can the United States contain the conflict and avoid being drawn in? We speak to a former U.S. Special Envoy for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. Joy and relief from the father of an American teenager who was released by Hamas on Friday. She and her mother walked free. What does it mean for the other hostages who are trapped in a war zone? We go behind the scenes of the frantic race to free them with a former FBI hostage negotiator. U.S. President Joe Biden has made no secret of America's support for Israel. He issued this warning while in Tel Aviv last week. My message to any state or any other hostile actor, thinking about attacking Israel remains the same as it was a week ago. Don't. 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 The president has also urged restraint from Israel. When America experienced the hell of 9-11, we felt enraged as well. While we sought and got justice, we made mistakes. So I caution the government of Israel not to be blinded by rage. The United States entering the diplomatic chat could have a chastening effect on both Israel and its adversaries in the region. But as rage has spilled across Israel and the Middle East, there's an uptick in protests and clashes from the border with Lebanon to missiles launched by Houthi rebels in Yemen. So what is the United States trying to do to contain the risk to global security? Joining me now is Frank Lowenstein, a former U.S. envoy for Israel-Palestinian negotiations, as well as a senior advisor to then Secretary of State John Kerry. Frank, thank you so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. This seems like such a critical inflection point in history and, and potentially very dangerous one. People are expecting this to get much worse before it gets better. Do you think that there is any way this does not immediately turn into a very violent, very protracted conflict? Well, I think that there's a there's a decent chance that the Israelis will wait on the ground invasion uh, uh, for some period of time. Uh, uh, you saw two hostages were released yesterday. I think when there's negotiations going on to release hostages, the, the, the Israel's less inclined to go in militarily. But I don't see a scenario where they don't ultimately launch a, a major ground invasion. Uh, just because they they have decided as a as a government that they're going to take Hamas out and and prevent them from threatening Israel any longer, but also prevent them from governing Gaza any longer. In order to do, there's no way to do that from the air. I think they're going to have to go in there uh, and go honestly door to door in in Gaza City and and get down into the tunnels and blow those up uh, uh, to to just to, to achieve their stated military goal. So unfortunately, and I think that there's an increasing amount of of dialogue going on with the Israelis right now. There's an increasing amount of public pressure for them not to launch a full-scale invasion. Based on my prior experience there, I just don't see that as a likely outcome. I think the best we can hope for uh, is that they'll allow more time for humanitarian supplies to get in, allow more time for civilians to get out of harm's way. But I'm afraid we are looking at a long and, and, and brutal and deadly ground war, uh, both for the Israelis and, of course, for the Palestinians as well. Uh, President Biden's approach on this has been incredibly direct. He, he went to the region. He has tied the fight between Hamas and Israel to a fight uh, for democratic values shared by Canada, the United States, Ukraine, Israel. He's made it really about a definition of, of not only a regional conflict, but who America is. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on the U.S. president taking that approach, the, the benefits and the risks. So uh, first of all, I think it's important for people to understand that this came right from Biden, the desire to go to Israel, the strong statements that we've made in, uh, on behalf of Israel's right to defend itself. Those come from the heart of the president. So uh, there's been a lot of analysis of, of, of pros and cons of that trip and consideration of, of the problems that are going to arise if, if we own this war in Gaza, which I think we, we really do much more so than we have in the past. But that decision came right from, right from the president. I think he's very well aware uh, that there's political risks that will come along with that, and he's prepared to pay that price. My question is, how is that going, how calculus going to change over time? There, there is already getting a lot of blowback uh, from the left here in the United States. They see a lot of similarities between the plight of the Palestinians and racial injustice here in the U.S. Th those are Biden's core voters politically. 
in a lot of ways. So to the extent to which he's continuing to support Israel, and Israel is not doing everything it can to protect civilians, or at least the perception is that it's not, it's going to be increasingly difficult for, for President Biden to sustain that position. What do you believe President Biden is saying to Benjamin Netanyahu in private? Oh, I think he gave a very tough message to, 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 the, to the Israelis in private. Uh, and, 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 you know, as a U.S. president, you, you get some space to talk, have tougher conversations with the Israelis privately if you're really backing them up publicly. And, and my understanding, my, my, my guess is that what, what he told the Israelis privately was a lot tougher than what he told them publicly. Which, and the focus, I think, there is on a regional escalation, as we've described. There's a story in The New York Times today uh, uh, that the Israelis had, had been strongly considering a preemptive strike against Hezbollah right at the beginning of the war. I think we really counseled them strongly against that. I think there's a lot of push from the Biden guys on, on taking steps to address the humanitarian crisis there and taking all the measures they possibly can to protect civilians. If for no other reason than it's not in Israel's interest to have a massive humanitarian catastrophe that's resulting in you know, huge protests throughout the region. And as I said before, it's not really gonna be sustainable for President Biden politically. So I think there was a tough message on the humanitarian front. And then I think that there's a lot of questions about what comes next. Uh, in, in Gaza Strip. So assume Israel were to achieve its, its objectives there, which would come at great cost, uh, uh, not only to the Israelis, but of course, the Palestinians. And then what, what are you going to do after that? How are you going to address the governance issue if Hamas is no longer there? Yeah, I, I guess one of the questions on that that people have been floating is, is the, the Palestinian Authority a possibility. Could they govern? I mean, obviously, they're not going to allow Hamas to govern. Uh, the Israelis have no interest in annexing and keeping Gaza. That would be a mess for them. They're telegraphing that. Uh, is that a possibility that you could have Mahmoud Abbas come in? I do think that there is an opening that may emerge here, which we haven't had in the past. And that is with Hamas out of the picture, it is at least theoretically possible to have an election that unifies the Palestinian body politics. So Gaza and the West Bank and, uh, and Jerusalem as well. And that could really usher in a new era of, of Palestinian leadership that was representative of the views of the, of the Palestinian people, but that also brought a new generation of leadership right, uh, uh, to, to the forefront in terms of representing the Palestinian cause, uh, 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 figuring out how they're going to live with Israel um, you know, in, in, until there's, there's, a, there's a peace agreement. So I think that's going to be a, a, a really big focus of the Biden message to them is how can you empower the Palestinian Authority to the point where they're going to survive in the West Bank and, and ideally ultimately be able to, to govern both the West Bank and Gaza Strip. But I really want to stress, we're a very, very long way away from that right now. Uh, Abbas's popularity is probably 2% right now in the West Bank. The, the capacity of the Palestinian Authority to govern even in the West Bank is extremely limited. They're barely projecting any power outside of the capital of Ramallah right now. So yes, it, it makes sense on the face of it to have the Palestinian Authority take over in Gaza after Hamas is gone. But the practical realities of that right now are that we're a million miles away from that. And there's some very, very hard work that's going to need to get done in order to get them to survive in the West Bank and, and ultimately be able to play a role in Gaza in any event. What is the dialogue like between the United States and countries like Qatar or Egypt um, who, or Saudi Arabia, who, who have tremendous influence in this region as they're also at the same time dealing with that influence from Iran with Hezbollah and with Hamas? Yeah, so there's there, there's different components of that. I think with the uh, uh, the Egyptians and the Jordanians, I, I think we're we're going to be working with them as best we can uh, on the on the challenges in the West Bank. I think that's where they they can play the most active role, particularly the Jordanians. But we need to hear from them. We need to be in a dialogue with them where we're receptive to their perspective, because I think if we just side with Israel uh, on in in the West Bank as we sort of have in Gaza. Then, then there's very low likelihood that anything positive is going to come out of that. So I think on the, on the, on the Sunni Arab countries, the Emiratis, the, the, the Jordanians, the Egyptians, I think that there's going to be a lot of focus on what can happen to, to preserve the situation, uh, preserve stability in the West Bank. The Qataris play a slightly different role. They're, they're much more influential with Hamas. I think the, uh, the negotiations that, that resulted in the release of two American hostages were largely conducted with the Qataris. When we were there in 2014 trying to negotiate a ceasefire, we obviously don't engage with Hamas. So we, we engage really with the Qataris and the Turks because they were the ones that had influence with Hamas. So I think in the first instance, we're, we're, we're going to work with the Qataris and the, and, the, and the Turks and others as much as we can to get the hostages out. And then I think we need to hear from them uh, in terms of what a long-term plan looks like in Gaza Strip, because the Qataris in particular are the ones who provide the money for that. They're the ones who have the influence with actual players on the ground. 
So I think as we start to, to, to think about what the next step looks like in all this, the cutteries will play a critical role in helping us to figure that out. I know there's concern that America could be drawn into this militarily. Do you share that concern or do you think that that's an unrealistic scenario? I think it's it's possible, but I think we're going to do everything we can to avoid that. And that's why I think you see us really cautioning the Israelis not to escalate uh, the situation with Hezbollah and with Iran. I think we're prepared to engage militarily if we have to, but I think we'll do everything we possibly can to avoid that. And then if we do get dragged into that, um, I think we'll do everything we can to keep our role as limited as possible to really prevent this from escalating. So my, my sense is nobody really wants to, to have a military confrontation with the United States on I'm, I'm hoping that that'll be enough to keep the, the to keep us out of it. Just the threat of the massive force we can bring to bear should deter others from getting involved. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to have a a, a, a a huge mess to deal with in Gaza, in the West Bank and beyond. That's going to take up a, a lot of our time and energy. And I think, as I said before, it's going to cost us in terms of global public opinion and also in terms of political opinion here in the United States. Frank, were you surprised by what Hamas evolved into? I was surprised at the at the at the sheer brutality and the barbarity of this attack. Um, I'm not surprised that they're extremely angry and extremely frustrated. We had a, a, a initial conversation with Khaled Al Atiyah, the foreign minister of Qatar, during the 2014 negotiations, and Kerry effectively asked him, "What does Hamas want out of this? What do we have to do to get them to stop shooting?" And, and Atiyah said, "You know something? They don't want to live the way they live anymore. They'd rather die than continue with the status quo." So my, my concern here is that is that Hamas is prepared to uh, uh, fight to the very last uh, uh, to the very last man there, and that that then becomes an extraordinarily difficult challenge for the Israelis militarily and a challenge for us militarily. So what I was surprised by for, was not that they were angry and not that they were had the ability to 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 launch an attack like this. I was very surprised that they chose to be so barbaric and cruel about it because that doesn't help their cause at all, right? I know it's a, it's an expression of great frustration that many Palestinians are feeling. But you, you, when you start murdering innocent civilians in their home like that, I think the, the uh, you get to the point of diminishing returns very quickly. So, yeah, I was surprised that they effectively turned themselves into ISIS for the purpose of that attack. And that's they were much closer to Hezbollah previously. When, in other words, they had the social programs. They were trying to govern as best they could. And once you take the steps that they took on October 7th, there's no hope that they can govern any longer. There's no hope that they can be a legitimate political party any longer. And so I was I was surprised that they took that step. Frank Lowenstein, thank you so much for your time today. Hey, my pleasure. Good talking to you. Up next, the frantic race to get more hostages released in Gaza. On Friday, a glimmer of hope in what is a fraught and fragile situation for over 200 hostages. We saw the release of a teenage girl and her mother. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says that the release of all hostages are a U.S. government priority. They have my solemn pledge, those who continue to have loved ones held hostage by Hamas, that will continue to do that, working uh, as though these family members were our own. For more on the intense efforts behind the scenes, I'm joined by Phil Andrew. He is a former FBI hostage negotiator. He is also the principal of the PAX Group. Thanks so much for joining us today, Phil. Glad to be with you. A, a very difficult situation unfolding, obviously, in Gaza with these 200 hostages, still a lot of unknowns. Can you take us through what you expect is happening behind the scenes right now in the efforts to free these hostages? The first thing that we do as, as hostage negotiators is serve support to the families. So I would imagine that the negotiators are with families gaining insight and learning a lot about their loved ones. Um, because it's going to be very important if and when dialogue is established to be able to speak to them in a very human way. And I think one of the one of the things that we saw in the release of the mother and daughter it is it was it was pitched as humanitarian reasons, but I think probably after three weeks of being held, the hostage takers started to identify or connect with the hostages in some way, and to the degree that we can remind people that these are human beings, they are the mothers, daughters, sisters, brothers of others. That makes it a little more difficult to do the sort of things that we saw happen in the original attack, those, those horrible 
uh, acts of violence that were committed against others. So really working on, on that psychology, and I, I remember the last high-profile uh, Israeli hostage that was taken was a soldier, obviously very different than elderly people, some with dementia, women, children, people who are very vulnerable. But you're dealing with a, a complicated situation in terms of who has the hostages. When I was reading up on this, we talk about it as being Hamas, sort of broadly in the media. But they're now saying that Islamic Jihad and a number of other fighters may have basically run through the fronts in what became a bit of a, a free-for-all of this terrorist attack and taken back hostages who were never intended to be taken. How does it complicate things that you're not only negotiating for 200 people from different countries, but also now with a number of different groups who have different interests? That is such an important point you make there, that it is critical to look at each one of these hostages, each one of the hostage takings, and potentially even the hostage takers as an individual negotiation. Because one, we don't know even that those that were taken by Hamas, that we can kind of take a monolithic approach to that, that they may not be in the same location, they may not be held as sort of the prison, guard by the same people, and the interests of those individuals are going to change. One, they're not going to be all aligned, and two, they will change as this very dynamic situation that involves kind of a war theater at this point is going to change. We don't know, and, uh, other than what we've learned just by piecemeal, exactly who's holding these hostages. And there are folks that are just taking advantage of this, there are folks that are doing this for political reasons. There are folks that are doing this for to hold them as human shields or to uh, try to get diplomatic concessions. Um, and each one of those is going to reveal itself if we're careful in, in establishing the dialogue and engagement. It, you mentioned the, the human shields, and it makes me think not only about the airstrikes, which Hamas has said will release the hostages if you'll stop the airstrikes, but also the pressure of that expected ground invasion and, and how uh, brutal and bloody, frankly, that is expected to be and, and the desire to try to get the hostages out before that. How does that change the calculus in all of this? Typically, you're dealing with hostage takers who might be threatening to kill the hostages. But in this case, you're also dealing with a government, many of whom, in fact, most of whom those hostages were taken from as their citizens who could move into the area. It, it makes it a very complex dynamic. But when we approach these, and, and as we can continue to support these, um, the most important thing is to recognize that it, it's going, what you know now is going to change. And two, that you need to take a multilateral and multi-process um, uh, kind of engagement. That's why we've seen indications that third-party countries are getting involved. This is where NGOs that might have influence, perhaps even uh, organizations or entities or governments that we don't necessarily see as partners, they may still have influence here. And we have to open the dialogue and be open to, to any direction that that might might go. One of the things that we're taught as journalists when we're being trained, if you're ever taken hostage, is that the most dangerous time for a hostage is actually during a potential attempt at a rescue, because you could either be killed by your hostage taker or inadvertently by the people trying to save you. I know there's been some special forces raids across the border. How realistic do you think it is that they could rescue some of these hostages versus the need to rely on a willing release by Hamas and other groups? At this point, I think everything needs to be on the table. And um, those operational or tactical rescues, um, we they are very risky. They're not only risky to the hostages, but they're risky to the operators that effectuate them. And um, so that, again, is all the more reason that we, we move methodically. We take the time to gather the information, to exhaust all the the the, the less dangerous ways, and recognize that that the release of two should give us hope that there's potential for more folks being released and to really exhaust those. But where there's opportunities to collect intel, to um, remove folks safely, those we're, we're not going to have much insight into because they're going to be in the 
the covert and the uh, intelligence realm. Um, but you can imagine that if there's opportunity for that, um, most countries are going to be reviewing those in the context of whether they can do that safely or not. You've obviously worked on the negotiation side, but you see what happens to these hostages too and, and the state that they're in as they come out. What do you expect these hostages, including the Canadians who are there, are likely experiencing right now and, and what would their state of mind be? Well, well the, the hostages that I have um, debriefed and have, have come out, and one, this is the, the, you know, the, the painful traumatic experience um, of, of in which they were taken is is probably not something they've been able to even process. And now that we're weeks into this, this is where the you know the, the, the post-traumatic stress starts to reveal itself. But what we also see is that that sometimes there's a connection then between the hostage and the hostage taker. Not necessarily a positive one, um, but it often can be that there is in the dialogue of the hostage being able to reveal their true self, then there is a there is a um, kind of a turning in um, in the mind of the hostage taker that they really um, aren't interested in in causing continued pain and suffering. In other cases, they clearly are. But that's again why I think we need to treat each one of these cases in an individual for for. Um, the, the unique circumstances around each hostage taking and ho hostage takers. Phil Andrew, fascinating interview. Thank you so much for joining us with your expertise and knowledge. Thank you for having me. Up next, putting a human face on the cost of war. And now for one last thing. This week, we leave you with the harrowing first-hand accounts of people who are living through this crisis on the ground. I'll see you next Sunday. Like every single night, I feel this is it. This is the last night we're gonna live. I count my kids, cut the love with them, and bring them tight closer to me to make sure if something can happen, we're gonna be all in the same place. There's nowhere safe. Every single place is a target. And the supplies are already running out. We don't have this privilege of time. And we don't want this to be the end of my grandmother's story. Dying painfully, slowly, alone in Gaza, being captive. It makes me so angry that I even need to think about hurting somebody just to get my mom back. And I know my mom wouldn't want that, you know? It's just, it's really, it's just heartbreaking. How can human being accept situation like that? Why all over the world people have to stand up and to say no more situation like that?